Thank you for coming. I'm Marie Ray, and I am um, one of the co-chairs of Wakefield's Commission on Disabilities. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to each of the members of the commission. Lorna Davidson Conley, who is my co-chair. <laughs> Lois Benjamin, who's sitting way in the back, who is a founding member of this commission 20, 32 years ago. Kristen Bardall, Levon Coughlin, Janice Mirabasi, up oh, there she is in the front, Catherine Steady, Paula Thompson, Darcy Burns, who couldn't be with us this evening because she is not feeling well today. Um, and I don't see um, Bella Schwartz, do I? Oh, there she is. How are you? <laughs> Bella is our um, liaison to the Wakefield High School Youth Council. So most of us have never met because we have been running this council for the past two years on Zoom. So tonight is our first evening for many of us seeing one another face to face. So a little bit about the council. Um, Wakefield Commission on Disabilities is a nine-member board. We have a liaison from the um, Wakefield High School Youth Council, and we have a liaison to town council, who is Maureen Butt. And unfortunately, tonight is town council meeting, so that's why none of them are represented here tonight. We are appointed by Wakefield's town council, and we are comprised of individuals with disabilities. We're family members and caretakers of individuals with disabilities, parents. We have educators on the board. We have physical therapists and other professionals who support those with disabilities. We are governed by Chapter 40, Section 8J of the Massachusetts General Laws. The commission meets the first Monday of each month, currently via Zoom. Hopefully that changes soon. Our mission is to address the needs and concerns of our disabled residents and promote their full participation in the activities and services of Wakefield. We act as an advocate for the disabled community here in Wakefield. A part of that mission is to work to develop equal job opportunities for the disability community, hence our mission here this evening. So again, I would like to welcome all of you. We hope um, you will find this film inspiring as we um, first explore the meaning of intelligence and IQ. And to introduce the film and give you a little bit about the film is our commission mem member, Paula Thompson. Paula is also an employee of Communitas. They are partnering with us this evening. They have the um, rights to the film, so there will, can be no videotaping because this film is copyright written. Paula? Thanks so much, Marie. Now to the first part of tonight's program from award-winning filmmaker Dan Habib, Intelligent Lives. This movie is part of the Communitas New Higher Orientation, and we're thrilled to show it with you this evening. This movie is a catalyst to challenge what it means to be intelligent, showing that together we can create a world where everyone's abilities and talents are valued. We will join three people on their journeys and see the achievements they make. Intelligent Lives points to a future in which people of all abilities can fully participate in higher education, meaningful employment, and intimate relationships. During this movie, we encourage you to think about what intelligence means to you. And also, does anybody really reach any of their goals completely independently? Again, the movie will be followed by a panel conversation which will demonstrate what President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, sometimes a person with a disability is the best person for the job. Okay, so I'm gonna talk from back here. Um, I'm Lorna, and I just wanna say, isn't that a fabulous film that we just watched? Just tremendous, huh? Um, although um, this film was primarily on people with intellectual disabilities, I really want to emphasize that um, there are many, many disabilities out there, some that also have intellectual disabilities and some that don't. People that may be deaf, hard of hearing, low vision, 
um, people who have mental health problems, people who have physical disabilities. Um, there's many, many different disabilities out there that we need to think about on how we include people in our community. At this point, I'd really like to best stop making that noise. Um, introduce um, Jeff Gentry, who is sitting up there on the pan with the panel. He holds a Master's of Divinity degree and currently serves as the Disability Services Director at Jewish Vocational Service in Boston. <clears throat> Jeff currently leads a team of 15 career coaches who focus on two things, connecting transition age youth with disabilities to paid employment before leaving high school and equipping adults with disabilities to grow their careers. Jeff has committed his career on workforce development and disability services for the past 15 years. During that time, Jeff and his teens have equipped over 1,000 transition age youth and adults to secure employment or advance their careers in the community. In past years, Jeff has helped catalyze innovative initiatives like Impact, Ability, um, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation supported an initiative that empowered organizations and individuals with disabilities to prevent abuse and empowering people for inclusive communities. An organization that empowers transition age youth with disabilities to develop their leadership skills through community service. Jeff and his family live in Beverly, Massachusetts, where they spend their free time at softball games, the beach, and in front of the TV rooting for the St. Louis Cardinals. Please, let's welcome Jeff Gentry. Hey, how are you guys? I'm here. Good. Good to meet you. So, can we just freewheel or are there other questions? We can freewheel. You all have a divinity degree. It's a dangerous thing. Well, I will introduce the panel for you and then you can. That would be great. Let me see. All right. So, we put together um, a panel of uh, people that are workers from our local community. Um, to talk about uh, and answer some questions about employment in this area, in Wakefield and Melrose area. So before I do that, though, I'd like to just um, thank a couple of special uh, guests that came to join us tonight. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, Trish Glover, who's joining us from the Disabled Persons Protection Commission. Um, the Northeast Regional Coordinator for their Sexual Assault Response Team. So thank you for attending tonight. Um, also, Senator Jason Lewis is here, so thank you very much for joining us. And also, Donald, Representative Donald Wong is also in attendance tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, all right. And before we get started with uh, the panel discussion, I'm just going to introduce who we have here. So we have a few workers from Biddy and Bo's Coffee Shop, which is in Melrose. We have Dan, Daniel, and Ashley. Could you guys raise your hands? Thank you. They all come to us from Biddy and Bo's. Um, from Shaw's in Wakefield, we have Re Rena Jeffries, who is their personnel director. And she brought with her tonight Garrett and Dustin. And then from Whole Foods in Melrose, we have Shannon Cronin, who is the store support team leader. And she brought with her Stephanie, who is a cashier assistant at the Whole Foods. And, uh, all right, Jeff, I'm going to hand it off to you. Jeff, me first. I'm going to turn it on you guys. Um, what did you find exciting about the movie? I kind of liked it. It was kind of fun. Yeah. That movie is like heart touching. Okay, that's great. Heart touching. Any other thoughts on the movie? So, 
you all have jobs. Yeah. And you have a lot of people here who support you in work. Right? And that's really what it's about. As a community, if we expect people to work, guess what they're gonna do? Work. And there's a lot of good data behind it, actually. They, uh, the federal government did a national longitudinal transition survey. Mouthful, but it was 2,600 young adults, five years out from high school, right? So they were done for five years. And they wanted to find out what tells the difference or what's, what are the lines of separation between people who work and people who don't work. There were two evidence-based uh, solutions. One was, and it was the biggest by far, parental expectations. It was a 22% difference. It was something like, and I don't have the data because I didn't really want to bore you all night, but it's a difference between 20 and 42% were working five years out if their parents expected them to work. That is very much squared uh, with my experience. You all had parents, I would guess, in communities that expected you to work. The other thing, so I said two things. The other thing which I think is really important, and one thing I would say we didn't really see in that film, except maybe with Naomi. We don't know how old she was. Uh, we do know the situation in Rhode Island she was coming out of was let's say more complicated than they even presented on the screen. Uh, the other determinant is paid work before people finish high school, before they turn 22. So two things, we need to expect, and believe me, we do expect you all to work just like we do, right? Just like everybody else. And um, it's really important that we get young adults working early. And I mean early, 14. 15, right? And, you know, who am I, right? Uh, I've been doing the work for a while, but maybe you've heard of Temple Grandin. Has anybody heard of Temple? Saw her the other day, saw Dr. Grandin the other day um, at BU. She was speaking for an event for uh, MAB Community Services. And she was saying the same thing I heard her say seven or eight years ago when I saw her, which is we need more we need more like paper delivery jobs. We need more grocery bagging jobs. We need more people feeding cats and getting $5 for the weekend while the neighbors are in New Hampshire. We need more opportunities for young people to understand what it means to make a connection between work and getting paid. And you know what? Uh, she's done her homework, I think, Dr. Grandin, and she's right. We need to start sooner. And that's one thing I saw when I saw the movie, I'm like, these young adults, they're never going to have more money invested in them than when they're in high school, right? And if they're going to school till they're 22, and believe me, thanks to Representative Wong, thanks to Senator Lewis, Massachusetts spends hundreds of millions of dollars on day and employment services every year. They can tell you the details. Last time, yes. Last time I looked, which uh, when I was doing work, it was back when I was at Triangle, which I was at for many years, I think the number, Senator Lewis, was around $239 million a year, right? A lot, a lot, right? So we invest a lot to drop in the bucket compared to what we have when they're in school. So we really need to get people working young. Summer youth programs, all of that, really, really, really key. That's a lot of talking from me, huh? So tell me, who in your life expected you to work? Yeah, grab a mic. Right there. Yeah. My mother. Your mother. You can talk into this thing. Yeah? Your mother? Okay. And how did she... Like, how did she put that expectation on you? She just tell you, or was it just something you were expected to do? I tell you something I was expecting to do. I like your mother. This is a good thing. I like my mother too. <laughs> <laughs> my son, by the way, not a significant disability. When he turned 14, oh yeah, dropped him at Market Basket in Danvers. He's working, let me tell you. Tell me how his back hurts after five hours. Don't really care. It's good for him. 
What about the rest of you? Who expected you to work? It was, hmm. it was my dad. Your dad? Yeah. And how did he tell you that? Actually, actually it was my, my stepmom. Your stepmom? Yeah. Your dad. So there were multiple people. Yeah. Telling you that. Good. Can I ask you a question? Sure. When did you start working? How old were you? I was 18. Twenty-two. So I gotta tell you, there's nothing more discouraging than serving in adult services, which I still do. The Jewish Vocational Services, we just do one thing: employment, which is super fun to be workforce fundamentalists. It's really great. Um, grateful for our partners like Communitas and Triangle that do many different things, which is great. But it's very discouraging to meet a 22-year-old and you say, what have you done for work? Uh, I served coffee at my high school. Okay, good, good, that was a good thing. That should have been happening when you were 14, 15, right? Young, getting you moving, 18, that's awesome. And we have employers on stage. Let me tell you, uh, one thing I've learned in 15 years is if anybody tells you the reason the workforce is not diverse is because of employers, they're wrong. They're wrong. Look at all of us. We're here on what, a Monday night watching movies, talking about the workforce? Like, we are, there are many multitudes of us. Everybody's connected with disability. Everybody has a cousin. Everybody had a friend on their low league team who had Down syndrome. Everybody's connected. Employers are no different, right? They have those same connections. They want to be inclusive. So why have you as employers found it meaningful and valuable to employ people with disabilities? For me, it's seeing Stephanie come in for every shift, ready to go, probably has more of a positive attitude than anyone on our team. Um, and she's always willing to learn new tasks and help out however she can. Um, and she just brings like total happiness to the whole store because she's always walking around asking how everyone's doing. Um, any customer that she sees, do you need any help with anything? And just to see them be so happy that she's reaching out to them is awesome. That's so great. And so what I hear there, right? Great customer service, flexibility, showing up. How many of that, you know, there were probably other 18 year olds who started bagging the groceries than you did and working up front. I bet a lot of them banged out on some shifts. I don't mean to desiccate anybody or accuse, but I was that guy when I was their age. So showing up is value, right? It's real value for an employee, for people to show up. So that's great. And I think that is important. When it comes to employment, we need to find opportunities for people with disabilities to work where they can add value. It's not charity. Like, charity is not a good situation. You, you don't want people long term to hire people because they're being nice, right? Because that manager leaves, or that supervisor leaves. And that's me being nice, because hiring somebody because it's nice is not really truly valuing the contributions that people can make. And that can lead you to some places you don't want to go. So I sh I'm sure these are not your only employees with disability. No, they're not. So um, why, why do you find that important? Because everything she said is true. They're the people that show up all the time. If Dustin or Garrett don't come in, we know there's a, a situation. They're probably really sick or there's something we need to be concerned about. They're always there. They've always come with a positive attitude. Um, Everyone likes them. Uh, they bring that uh, joy to the to the front end. That's what they both work on the front end. Uh, customers look for them when they're not there. They're concerned that something's wrong. Garrett actually has ladies bringing him little gift bags. <laughs> so <laughs> they usually have Celtics paraphernalia in them, but. Um, yeah, in our other associates, we have a young man on the spectrum um, 
the perfect job for him is our new Doug drive up and go where he shops for people. Um, when we have a sick call, which is often in that area because the other teenagers don't come in, um, you call him on the phone and he runs to the store. Um, so if he's not working, he's will willing to drop everything and get to the store and um, it just seems very happy. He's very good at it. Uh, it's a perfect fit for him because he's he's not forced to interact with too many people um, so he can, you know, not be overwhelmed sometimes. Um, so, you know, the deaf gentleman that's in the back room cutting fruit, um, things like that, you know, so they add a lot to the, to the business and it's, and they're the nicest, most pleasant people to deal with. Do you hear that? His job is great. <laughs> that's also, that's also what she's saying, right? Like, yeah, he doesn't like interacting with folks that much. So do you really want the person who's picking up your teapot order? I'm sorry, that's not your brands probably. <laughs> to be interacting with a lot of the customers? Yeah. Probably not, right? Yeah, and I apologize for the uh, for the mask. I've had this cold that is not COVID. Every antigen test says, but you don't want it. Um, so sorry, you're okay. Yeah, KN95. Um, I check the labels. Um, but look at that. That's that's accommodation, right? He's we know what he's good at. We put him in that slot. He outperforms other employees, right? And for young people with disabilities, good advice there. You know, nobody has ever filled every role in a job description, every bullet, including me, including probably the other employers on this stage, right? Apply, give it a shot. You don't know where you're gonna be able to add value. And that goes for you if you have young adults with disabilities. Put their name in the hat, make the connection. Like, there are a lot of people who want to make accommodations. And can we take a minute and just be really grateful for grocery stores and the role that they played post-institutionalization in America in creating pathways to employment for people with disabilities? You guys are amazing, right? No, I mean, it's, it's for real. And I think we can be deeply grateful for that and at the same time saying, my son started at 14 bagging groceries and pushing carriages. His colleagues in school who have ASD, right, or have intellectual disabilities, believe me, on his, they can perform as well as my son. They should be there beside him, right? It's a starting place and maybe an advancement place to go cut fruit or to go you know, do carriages or to figure out how to handle a COVID rush. How many young people with disabilities were essential workers during COVID? So, right, right. Essential workers, right? It's so vital. But we need more young people starting there. And then if they choose to have a career at Whole Foods or Shaw's, awesome. Biddy and Bo's, awesome, right? But it can be an option for them, right? Not just their only path, but you gotta start early, right? All of us know, all of us adults know, as you walk down the hall of life, more doors are open or closed? Closed, right, as we get older. And I'm not saying it to be negative, that's just entropy, right? We learned it in physics class or whatever in high school. So start early. I think that that's a, a real big key. And at JVS Boston, um, the, the nice uh, disability representative read my bio. That's why we only do two things. We focus on getting young adults with disabilities jobs before they exit high school, before they're 22. We have a great Cornerstone Transitions to Work program, uh, which takes place at employers, Whole Foods historically, has been one of them. Boston Children's Hospital has been one of them. Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, which employs a lot of people with disabilities, uh, is one of them and it's about getting jobs before people exit, right? Because once you exit high school, ideally you need to have your first job under your belt. And that's not a disability thing. That's a life thing. Um, and then we work with adults with disabilities to help them advance their careers and find pathways there. Um, 
I could talk a lot more about Jewish vocational services. I don't think you came out for a sales pitch, but if you want to hear more about it, believe me, I can talk about it. Uh, I will say this, I'm very proud of our organization. Before I was here, I was at Jerry Rubin, who was our CEO for 15 years, his retirement party uh, down on the South Boston waterfront. And uh, I would say this, it's pretty impressive that the largest workforce development agency in, in, in New England, there's 170 of us. Can you imagine the opinions in the room at that party? Oh my God, 170 of us milling around? Um, but that's all we do is work on employment. And we'll work with anybody who's served by anybody during the day. In fact, that's great. People should um, access communitas for recreation. Even when I was at Triangle back in the day, my, one of my dear friends, Shanine Pelequin, was at EMARC. I'm like, Shanine, you do the rec stuff because I have never in my life cared if the bean dip got to the party. Still don't, right? You guys have heard of FOMO, right? I'm, uh, I'm more of a JOMO person, the joy of missing out. <laughs> when it comes to social things, I am a JOMO person. Um, we need a lot of organizations and a lot of parents doing a lot of different things. When it comes to jobs, JVS is a really good place to reach out to. Even if we might say, hey, you live in Dorchester and you're down the street from Work Inc., talk to this person at Work Inc. Right, and make your make your advantage. Biddy and Bose guys, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Why do you love working at Biddy and Bose? <coughs> I don't have the question, so I'm just asking. Yeah, that's totally fine. <coughs> the thing I like most about working is that it makes me feel happy to work with different people and to meet a lot of different customers. I like to talk to people and enjoy getting to know them. I also like dancing. We do the best dance parties at Bailey and Bo's. Being a part of a family, it makes me feel really happy on in the inside. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, that's just one of the Bitty and Bo's guys. So, yeah. somebody else, why do you like working there? Oh, you. Okay. Okay. I am a boss. I am. I am. I am this. I am. I am. Can table. Yep. I am a car. Yep, you're capable. And what, you? what was the last thing? I am. I am. I am. Can uh, I walk ta you, table? Oh, you clean and wash tables. Yeah. I'm gonna have to have you teach my daughter. She's got some issues there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Good job, Dad. Thank you. Jeff, can we entertain some audience questions? We absolutely can. Oh, sorry, Dean. I want to. Everybody's got to talk first, though. Why do you like working at Biddy and Bose? Uh, I love this movies. You like the movie too? Smoothies. Like smoothies. The, yeah. Oh, what flavor? Uh, any smoothie I love. All right, I love it. And my friend from Shaw's. Why do you Why do you enjoy working at Shaw's? So I've worked um, before we moved here. I worked at a movie theater. So a lot of again working with people, and a lot of that is just bringing a good day, especially with the price of groceries getting as they are now. Oh. Not everyone's coming in with the best <laughs> attitude about their, now their $5, $5 avocado, I think it was, or something. And so you can help them. You can help them have at least a better day at that point. And right. that can be a small stone, but a small stone can eventually make a big wave in their life. You're right. Why did I let him stay quiet for so long? Uh, are there any questions from the audience at all? Or points of contention, that could be fun too. Y'all, I think they're more shy than we are. <laughs> 
So I just, I just wanted to say something. So when we think about disabilities, sometimes when we look at it, we see it as a pair of crutches. The person walks in on crutches and we see those crutches and we automatically define what those crutches mean. And so sometimes when we see those crutches, we have this idea of how far they can go, what they can do. I'm legally blind. I've drawn. I've done sculptures. I've done a lot of things that some people would think a legally blind person can't do. And even at my job bagging, some people have thought I wasn't legally blind. Um, and sometimes it's that step forward of looking at a disability and saying, well, where is that limit? Not defining it, but actually finding it. I like to say, if you, if you haven't failed, you haven't tried. And if you haven't tried, you haven't taken action. And action speaks louder than any words you could ever say. I think you guys have your next facilitator. That is, that's so great. All right, so yes. Good question. Give us some times. How long have you been at your job? What's right here? How long have you been at your job? I've been working at Whole Foods for. How old are you now? I'm, I'm thirty. I'm thirty-three. Yeah. At least. I've had a job where I worked for Whole. Um, before I worked for uh, Whole Foods. All right, so nine years. It's about nine years. Keep going. How many years? Um, I've been working at Charles for 12 years. Awesome. Hand it down. Thank you. I've just been working since about the end of last year after kind of COVID settled down. So how long were you at the movie theater? I was there for almost a year. We were moving, and unfortunately, they didn't really have any new branches, any branches here that I could transfer to, awesome. so they gave me a letter of recommendation instead. Awesome. Our startup guys here <laughs> from Biddy and Bose. How long have you been at Biddy and Bose? I will say 2021. Okay, so about a year? Yeah, about a year. Awesome. Same for you guys, about a year? Yeah, same for me. I worked at Benny Bowes for like, a, since 2021, and I really wanted to work there so bad. <laughs> you really want to what? I really wanted to work at Benny Bowes so bad. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's kind of a goal. Yeah, it's it's one of my great goals in my life. Awesome. I've been working at Benny Bowes since after my events in my senior year, and I really, really wanted to work, work in a coffee shop so bad with my great friends Dan and Ash. All right, and a year for you as well, right? Okay, I am a trophy to one. I am. I I am. I two one. I am. I work hard. I am no job. I am. So, this is this is awesome. And unfortunately, Massachusetts is a little bit better than most other states for our students with intellectual, not students, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Employment rate hovers between thirty five and forty percent. Employment rate for people without disabilities in Massachusetts hovers closer to 70%. So there's still a sizable gap. But I can tell you, I mean, look at the, the individuals we have here, and I've worked in high schools all, all over. 70% um, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism, at least 70%, can work with the right supports, right? With the right expectations with the right pay-in to take care of the cat jobs when they're 12 so that they're starting to move in that direction. And everybody can make a contribution. We've got to shrink the gap, which by the way is more like 20% to like 68% nationwide. 
So the investment our legislators have made and our incredible special educators, the expectations they have as well, has made a huge impact. We've still got a ways to go. We have a lot to be proud of. We have ways to go as well. Yep. I just wanted to comment on the employers. And that is that um, I commend them. I know since my son, Garrett, has been in high school, you know, he's worked at Shaw's. And they know, they know their employees so well, all of their employees, but they know what areas to target and what's going to be good for building the self-confidence and, you know, um, stretching his expectations. It works, it works. If it doesn't, they bring it back in. Um, and so I really want to commend them for that because they do truly care and feel for their employers, employees. Thank you, Rena. Yeah, yes. And let me tell you, they have colleagues in every industry. I have a young man who uh, passed his high school equivalency exam in, in Connecticut, Didn't, was not able to uh, be diploma bound in college, but was in a college program kind of like we saw at Syracuse. He, he is now working inside sales at a tech company that does HVAC outsourcing for chain restaurants. Uh, don't tell me, don't ask me how it works. And he's crushing it, right? So there are employers in every field that are just as willing and accommodating as our grocery store partners, our retail partners, our restaurant partners, right? We need to ask, we need to ask. And we need to convert these dollars. Like this is on us as providers. Like we need to get better at asking and getting out in the community, starting early, educating employers, not on charity, but on the value, right? We say we have a staffing crisis in Massachusetts. Well, we've got a lot of people with disabilities that can really do the job. Can they do the whole list? Probably not, but like I told you, I can't do the whole list at my job either, right? And they let me like sit up on stages and talk. So I think it's okay, right? So we, we need to, to get better at, at laying that expectation as well. Um, and that's, no, I'm not gonna go down that road. Let, let me just say like, we need to start young. And sometimes when I see too much, like on the video, one of the things that kind of made me that raised some flags for me was when Naomi got the job how many people were like hugging her and putting hands on her like it's it's lovely and at the same time I was kind of like that's weird if somebody did that to my kid at Market Basket I might be having a talk with the manager <laughs> like, later in the day right so it's kind of around the expectations that we have of the value that people with disabilities bring. And nobody at Empire Beauty School had a bad intention, not a bad bone in their body, not, not one. But what's the expectation? Is this person going to bring value in what way? Are they a real member? Would you hug every single student at Empire Beauty? Probably not. So we need to ask ourselves questions, why we jump to that, right? Yes. I was wondering for all the um, our hard workers on the stage, how they got connected with their Job, or in like a store or their um, job coaches, was it through school or a different organization? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, my stepmom actually helped me with the job. My mom did, and in high, high school, yes. Probably a partnership, probably a partnership, yep. Mine was through a program called, uh, kind of a work program called Envision that helped uh, 
that just helped facilitate getting a job. Uh, Shaw's was mostly kind of a cold call situation where I was looking near my house and we found Shaw's. And so I talked to the guy who I work with, the job coach, and he said, okay, I'll contact them. And we kind of just went from there. Love it. How are you connected to your jobs at Video Post? Uh, my connected um, will be... I think it feels good to be there. You think it feels good to be there? Yeah. Yep. How'd you find out about Biddy and Bose? Uh, I just found out uh, when I see nice people there. Awesome. About the same? What was the question? How did you find your job at Biddy and Bose? Who connected you? Uh, my mother. Mom? My mom over there. Her name is All right. Miguel. All right. Good, good. How did you find your job? In. Okay, I am, I lack, I lack, I lack, mom. Yeah, your mom. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, this fortune back is not the Ashley's only job. Communitas did you a solid twice. I mean, yeah. you're the person who got the job. Yeah. They, they helped you. So, who's the best, who are the best people to connect us to employment? What'd you hear up here? Primary. Family. Family. Connections, networking. Same for people without disabilities? Same for people without disabilities. It's almost like this inclusion thing is for real. <laughs> no, I, it really is. Families are, are key. That's really where it starts, and families have the best ideas. They know their individual the best. That doesn't mean that you don't get cold calls sometimes, or you don't have people at Triangle or JVS or Communitas who help you. All good, but families are almost always involved, right? So I, I think that's really, really key. So if your child's looking for a job, your network should know, right? You need to, to be asking. Um, I had a young woman who's getting ready to graduate from college at Clark University, who's on my caseload. I still career coach because it's my favorite thing. I, I love to coach, so I have a small caseload. And her parents said, what you need to do is write a letter to your inner circle of people you love and trust and tell them you're looking for a job, tell them your fields, and ask them for help. So that was my job with her. I met, I fit her in on Saturday morning. I revised her letter to her network, right? Smart, smart guidance from a parent, right? Spending all your time on Craigslist and Indeed, not smart. Should that be a part of your job search? Yeah, of course, of course it should, right? But it's really the family and the, the networking because we know you get, we know you all have the capability work it's just about the connectivity any other questions yes I'd just like to you know thank the uh, Commission on Disabilities for presenting this movie for having this panel discussion and even though I believe this is the right thing for businesses to do to, to hire disabled persons um, is there any kind of tax incentives or anything for businesses to yeah. Good question. We'll let our grocery store friends answer that because they probably know. Part of the application process is a determination of um, status as far as um, any assistance through public assistance or you know social agencies. Um, so that's the targeted jobs tax credit. Now I've lost track of how long we are eligible for some of that. So for every dollar that we pay, they give it's us like a tax. It's like a 40% tax Is it, And I'm not sure how long that lasts, how I many think. years. Um, but a lot of times I find that people that should be targeted as um, eligible don't answer the questions that way. 
so we don't gain anything from that alliance. So it all depends on how you answer the questions. I do know that the new Massachusetts um, wage law, which is great for everyone to earn a, a living wage, which will be $15 in January of 2023, is already affecting people that are on assistance or, or SSI how many hours a week they're going to be able to work or a month so that they're, you know, they've got a, a max they can earn. And because Massachusetts is full with thinking and paying so much an hour, um, we're going to have people cutting back on their hours because they won't be able to work as much. And can I talk about that for a minute? Yeah. When it comes to how much people can earn on SSI or SSDI, there are professionals that are funded through the state who can help you learn about reporting your income and oftentimes people can and should work more than they do uh -huh. and a lot of times they are trading on bad information and fear about SSI and SSDI. So there are work without limits benefits. Uh, I think in this area it's project impact with MRC. If anybody has questions with that, I have my cards. I'll shoot you a connection. I'm not a certified workforce counselor, but I've heard enough myths about SSI and SSDI over the years. People should work. You work. You earn more if you work. And, um, and there are some complicated situations, but that's why the state pays benefits counselors and the federal government through Medicaid to support you. So if you have a child and it's like, how will it affect SSI? The short answer is, you don't know. Talk to the people who can help you work the math, and they're free, and they're really fantastic. Um, but you're right, it is affecting things. Um, it'll affect it more if we cut back too much without asking people who can help us and provide guidance. Any other questions? You know, something interesting I found most small businesses or employers, even though they can do the, work, the income tax credit, most of them do not hire for that reason. You know, like it's an additional bonus if they even remember to fill in the paperwork. So it's interesting. You'd think it would be this huge benefit, and it, it is. It's a good benefit. People should use it. Like, I'm all for it. But um, most... It is the right thing. It... It's the right thing to do if it's the right fit and the worker with or without a disability can help add value, right? And um, people with disabilities can. A lot of times that's just figuring the right job for the right person. But I'm with you. Employ more. All right, any other questions or are we at time? Uh, out of time? We are at time. Can I... Thank you guys so much for being up here and our employer partners. I doubt this was in your Whole Foods or Shaw's job description to be here tonight. So thank, thank you so much. And thank you all for sharing about your story. We know it's your story. So to come here and, and tell us your story about Betty and Bo's and Shaw's and Whole Foods is, is, is really a gift. And keep working because, you know, I'm going to be on Social Security myself someday. I'm depending on you. Okay. Thank yes. Thank you all to the panelists, to Jeff. We really appreciate you coming. Representative Juan, Senator Lewis is gone, but thank you, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you found this informative, um, and it, this was really to introduce the community um, and start the discussion of why you know we need to open our doors more uh, to individuals with disabilities and employment. Thank you. Thank you.